Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is representation theory. Today I would like to tell you again about characters because characters are so cool and important, so character tables. And I will focus on kind of examples, so how to find examples, how they usually look like, what kind of patterns are known in some simple examples. Um, so in general, for example, um, there's the atlas, which I'm going to pull up at the very end, which is uh, the first big data on character tables, if you want. But nowadays, probably it's smarter. Well, maybe not probably, but certainly it's, well, I, I shouldn't say anything here, but I, I certainly would use um, kind of a computer algebra program to get those characters. Um, there's a little bit of a discussion how reliable the Atlas actually is. Um, it's a bit tricky, but not, it, it's, it's actually still a really good source. So um, there are certainly mistakes in the Atlas. It's a huge book. And every huge book contains mistakes, uh, but it's 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 actually pretty mis mistake free compared to everything I will ever write in my whole life. Um, so it's not so bad. Anyway, I'm already raffling, so let's get started. So kind of today, I would like to explain to you um, some of the simple character tables that you kind of should know if you work in representation theory, and the more sophisticated ones maybe that's something you look up if you need them. So maybe the easiest one are the character tables of abelian groups. So here's my example of a character table of C8. This can be identified with Z mod 8. Right? So um, the cyclic group of order 8. And um, so Z mod n has usually n simple characters. So Z mod 8 should be have eight simple characters as listed here, uh, row 1 up to row 8. So this table likes to use rows instead of chi's. Fine. But anyway, the simples are row one up to row eight, and it has eight conjugacy clauses, whatever. And the size of those conjugacy clauses is all one, because in the abelian case, um, if you have a conjugacy clause, which is something like you want to conjugate an element A by, by B, for example, by B and B inverse, and if it commutes, then those two could just cancel. So conjugacy clauses in abelian groups are always of order one, and kind of what I like to think about is kind of conjugacy classes, the size of the measures, how far away uh, a group is of, from being well, a billion. So for a billion, they're all of size one. And you have those conjugacy classes. And the simple characters are basically given by eighth roots of unities. And whenever you have really a primitive eighth roots of unities, this is uh, well simple here, chi, you actually get even get a faithful representation. Um, but anyway, so you have eight one-dimensional representations. Remember the dimensions are here in this line and they're basically given by choosing um, an eight root of unity and you have eight of them. Some of them are primitive, some of them are not primitive and the primitive ones gives you the faithful representations so the injective representations and the non-primitive ones give you the others. But basically it's just choose a root of unity and that's it. And you have n choices and these are your simple representations all of degree one. So basically what you really should do is there's one generator, let's say you call it one, and you associate uh, a one by one matrix to it, which is given by some root of unity. And if you run over the root of unities, that gives you your character table. And for general abelian groups, something similar happens because general abelian groups are just, <laughs> just uh, products of those cyclic groups. So representation theory of abelian groups is really, really easy. Um, remember that we always work over something like C because we need those funny root of unities here. So if you are unlucky and you're not in uh, dividing and you are in dividing characteristic, for example, two for, for a Z mod eight, then the roots of unities won't exist and things change quite a bit. But you can ignore that uh, for most of the time if you're working over C and everything is just given by picking a certain root of unity and that's it. Which kind of a nice sounds, all right? It's not too bad for a billion groups. It's actually pretty simple. Um, very important representation theory of the symmetric group. Um, this is usually how the character table somehow looks like. So this is S4. I will run you through some examples uh, later. Um, and then in later videos, I will carefully discuss the representation theory of, of Sn in general, because it's really, really fascinating and beautiful and somehow easy. But you can already see here, it has not just one dimensional representations, it has two three dimensional representations, for example, two one dimensional ones and a two dimensional one. And in this case, it has five characters and five conjugacy clauses. So S4 is a group of order of 24. And something we will observe in a second, or we will observe when I run magma, is a fascinating, 
fascinating property of the character table of S4, which is really, really different from this one and from character tables of almost all groups, is that the character table is always integral. So the numbers you see here are actually always integers. You don't need rational numbers. You don't need complex numbers in general. You just need integers. So, so integers really just elements on Z, which is an extremely remarkable property. You usually don't see that in ca uh, character uh, tables. This is really, really remarkable. We'll see that later, uh, not today anymore, but this is, this is one of the properties you should try to remember from character table of symmetric groups. It's, it's really, really special groups. There's really, really special representation. Special in the setup means important. So representation theory of the symmetric group that's just everywhere in mathematics. And it's simple and beautiful and yeah, will be covered in a later video, uh, not this time. Um, just one warning, the characters do not determine the groups. The characters would determine the representations but representations do not necessarily determine the groups. So the character table of those uh, order eight groups, uh, the quaternions, uh, usually denoted by Q8, Q8, uh, quaternions, order eight, D4, which is also of order eight, because, well, you always need to take this number here and take it times two. So the hedral group, the symmetry group of uh, the square, right? So the square has four rotational symmetries, that's why D4, and then the reflectional symmetries, which double everything, so uh, order eight. And the character table is exactly the same, right? It has five simple representations and they have exactly the same characters and they're exactly the same number of conjugacy classes. Uh, it's, it's pretty remarkable, but they have really the same characters. So you can't quite determine the groups from the characters. There's a trick how you can, well, maybe not a trick, but there's, there's a way how to determine the group from the characters, but um, just for, so from the um, representation theory, uh, but just from the character table is, that we know here right now is just not enough, just a warning here. Anyway, so let me now discuss a few examples. So uh, abelian groups, pretty nice. They're determined by choosing just the root of entity. And if you have order n, you have n different uh, simple representations given by choosing those roots of entities for uh, the potentially more than one generator. Depends a bit what kind of abelian group you have. Um, the hedral groups, um, I will run Mathematica, no, not Mathematica, uh, Magma in a second and we will see those, the hedral groups is, have either two or four one-dimensional representations, depending on the parity, it's a bit annoying. So it's either two or four, uh, depending on <laughs> whether it's even or an odd uh, symmetry you're representing, whether it's a square or a pentagon, if you want. And then there are the two-dimensional representations, which are really just the rotation representations, uh, so the, the symmetry representations of the, uh, the hedral groups. We'll see them in a second. Uh, the symmetric groups for now, the most important property is that they're integral, show you some symmetric groups in a second. Uh, also very important, the alternating groups. Um, I don't think really much is known about the representations of the alternating groups. They're much harder than the symmetric groups. In particular, they're not integral, um, but kind of from the integrality of the symmetric group, you can at least come up with the statement that each row or column in the character table contains at most two irrational numbers. We'll see that in a second as well. And um, it also has only one dimensional, uh, only one one dimensional representation. It's only the trivial representation. What you can also do is characters of certain uh, special linear groups also on. And again, not too much is known about the general flavor of those. Um, so we will see some examples. So let's actually go to Magma. So here's Magma, link is in the description. You can use the online calculator of Magma, it's pretty cool. Um, it will time out at one point, but at least calculations I'm going to do right now are not big enough uh, for us to worry. So let's try some cyclic groups. So I just use some very silly code to do it. Um, it's pretty simple. A link to everything is in the description. So here's how it works. I define by cyclic group five, which is really just a cyclic group of order five. A CT is just a character table, as it says, and I just let magma display CT uh, sub. And here you go. So it tells me the simple characters, uh, one up to chi one up to chi five. It tells me the conjugacy clauses. It tells me the sizes of the conjugacy clauses. It tells me uh, the order of the elements of the conjugacy clauses. Um, so order five elements, except for the trivial one. And it tells me in characteristic P equals five, I have to be careful. Well, P equals five, you don't have a fifth suit of unity. A little bit downstairs, it will tell you that these are fifth suit of unities. And you can already see here, this character table is exactly how we 
have seen it before. So you have the trivial representation and everything else is kind of determined by choosing a fifth root of infinity, either z1, z1 squared, z1 cubed, or uh, z1 to the fourth. And then you just permute them through. And this will look like this in general. So if you go to something like c9, uh, cyclic group of order nine, here you go. That's a character table. You have nine of them, one up to nine. You have nine conjugacy clauses. Um, and you see the ninth root of unities in this case turning up. So it just says cyclotomic field of, of, of for nine, so these are just nine roots of unities. And you kind of permute them through. And depending whether you choose, so nine is not a prime. So depending whether you choose here um, a primitive root of unity or not, you might end up with uh, really this type of table or with a little more simplified table. And that's kind of the gist of it. And that this is usually, uh, well, except the characteristic P equal three, of course, because now it's nine, right? Nine is divisible by three. Careful in those characteristics, but otherwise it's pretty simple and pretty beautiful, basically roots of unities. Okay, so let's uh, change the group. So we can also go to something like um, the dihedral group here, so cyclic groups. So let's do dihedral groups. Um, there you go, dihedral groups. Let's see, the Hedral group of order 28. Um, this is how the character table looks like. As I promised, it has up to four one-dimensional representations and the rest is filled up with two-dimensional representations. And since you know that the sum of the squares is always the group order, you can actually calculate how many two-dimensional representations you have. And they are given by certain types of rotations. So you need um, roots of unities to make it work. So maybe we do a slightly smaller example. Maybe we just go to eight here. So let's see the Hedral group of order eight has again uh, four one-dimensional ones and three. Uh, so uh, the dihedral gate of order eight is 16 because eight times two is 16. Has four one-dimensional ones and three two-dimensional ones. And of course, um, if you square those, it ends up, adds up to 16. And the character table looks very similar as before. And now if you go to nine, um, something funny happens. Oops, this is zero. This is, of course, bad. Let's go to nine. The Hebrew God of order zero. Um, so the parity happens here. So we have uh, only two one dimensional ones, and the rest will be filled up with two dimensional representations. So that's the Dahedral group. Um, okay, so let's explore some symmetric groups. So Dahedral groups, this magma can also do symmetric groups. Here we go. Um, submit. Um, I should put a semicolon here and do it again. Submit, there you go. Um, kind of nice, and as, you, as we observed here, so that the representation gets pretty big, six dimensional representation, and everything is integral, which is really amazing. So if you take an even bigger group, um, let's say a symmetric group eight, that's already pretty big, eight factorial is the size. Uh, woo, quite big here, as you can see, it has huge representations, one is of order 90, but the table is completely integral, has no funny number turning up. It's pretty nice. And you have to be careful in dividing characteristics as well. And otherwise it's, well, you can read off the table. So I really encourage you to play around with it. Uh, let me just, uh, <laughs> to finish, do the alternating groups as well. And you kind of will see uh, one of the properties of so alternating groups, so alternating group A5. And well, it certainly has, is not integral anymore. Um, also has pretty big representations, only one one dimensional one, and only at most two funny entries per, uh, per row and column, as I promised. So that's kind of what is known. Let's go to a bigger one, maybe eight. Um, let's see, only two funny entry, at most two funny entries per row and column, and otherwise quite big representations. Anyway, link to Magma and to this very silly code is in the description if you want to play around. Magma knows way more groups. Magma knows some special linear groups and a lot of groups. So it's a lot of fun to play around with it. But let's kind of the modern version of the Atlas. So the Atlas is a very famous book uh, written in the 80s. And <laughs> here's a quote by Sayer. So can't think of any other book published in the last 50 years which has such an impact. Uh, probably referring to mass books, and not to books in general. But anyway, this already tells you how important this uh, book was, or still is in some sense. So I just uh, took a photo of the front page. So um, it, it's kind of nice to look it up. It's huge, a huge book. It's not the usual format. It's much bigger. Um, so you should actually want check it out one, at one point in your life. Uh, it's really worth worthwhile to do it, and it contains mostly character tables, so huge character tables. 
Um, so let me open uh, my PDF version of the Atlas for you. So here's my PDF version of the Atlas. As you can see, it's from the 18, well, mid of the 80s. And here in the table, you see all those funny groups that you would like to maybe know something about. I have no idea. Here is Suzuki group, for example, and you will find character tables of those groups, which are really huge in this case. Maybe let's have a look at a different group. Here's another one of the sporadic simple groups. It's, it's called the Jenko group, uh, the third one of them. Uh, you will find a lot of numerical data associated to the group. And of course, then also character tables, quite a bit of character tables, which is actually very impressive. So this was done in the 80s, basically by hand, and it's almost um, typo-free. So it's really, really impressive. And uh, was one of the most important books uh, following SEA, uh, at least published in mathematics in the past 50 years, which is really, really nice and impressive. And probably, um, well, just check it out yourself. It's, it's a really cool book, um, huge if you have it in front of you. Um, it's really worthwhile. Nowadays, as I said, it's probably easier to just look up characters online, uh, like in Magma. Magma also knows other properties of groups. But in the 1980s and up to, certainly up to 20 years ago or so, this was one of the main sources for many, many researchers. So it's really, really good. And part of history of mathematics, rightly so, really important. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed today's video. It was a little bit different as usual uh, from the usual ones. It was more like, this is how you could do it. Just look up some character tables. So characters are really built to collect data and you should do that in some computer algebra program or whatever. So um, play around a little bit with magma. It's a lot of fun. You can try special linear groups or whatever, or higher dimensional symmetric groups, higher dimensional dimension doesn't make sense. Uh, higher, uh, so bigger symmetric groups if you want then I try it. It's really a lot of fun. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.